So here we are. Thank you so much for the attendees that are still with us. Uh, it's uh, it's evening now. It has been a long um, afternoon of discussion or morning of discussion if you are in, uh, in the United States. And let me uh, introduce now the, uh, the next uh, um, chair, uh, Stephen Holden, uh, Project Senior Research Associate, PhD candidate at the Manchester Metropolitan University. Stephen will uh, chair a panel uh, focused on disinformation and the corporate world. And after this panel, uh, we will just have the conclusive remarks and we are looking forward to listening to Professor Diane Ring that will offer the remark. So uh, thank you very much. Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I think following on from the, the format that every uh, the previous panels have done, it would possibly be supportive that if, if there are questions to kind of save them for the end. So if people would like to, to pull the hand up um, and then we can get to a question at the end and sort of uh, filter through them. So, uh, dear all, thank you very much for joining us for the third panel today. As Costa just mentioned, uh, we are considering the use of disinformation in the corporate world. My name is Stephen Holden. I'm a senior research assistant for the Whistling at the Fake Project. In addition to being a PhD candidate at Metro uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, examining the phenomenon of whistleblowing in secrecy, and I'll be the chair for today's discussion. This panel is in collaboration with the uh, Whistling at the Fake Project's official partner, the Corporate Social Responsibility and Business Ethics Blog. The Corporate Social Responsibility and Business Ethics Blog is a scientific forum for analysis and discussion of the corporate social responsibility and business ethics issues around the world. It aims at offering informed commentary uh, and debate on the corporate issues affecting our societies. The blog also represents an innovative teaching platform, which is intended to facilitate interactions with postgraduate students at international level through the participation of academics from different countries as members of the editorial board. The blog reaches some 25,000 uh, readers every year over the globe and continues to expand and inform discussions on salient issues of CSR and business ethics. Typically, discussions surrounding the use of misinformation and disinformation occur predominantly within two spheres. Firstly, as a means of discourse between private individuals, by example, the sharing of information on social media surrounding conspiracy theories such as COVID being caused by 5G. Secondly, within the context of achieving political aims and attempts to persuade others to align themselves with political goals. However, and significantly, much less has been said regarding the use of hostile information conduct within the context of corporate behaviours or as a means of achieving corporate goals. This is not to say that behaviours of this type do not occur. We're all very aware of instances of corporations and organisations misleading investors, stakeholders, regulators and the general public in pursuit of profit or to avoid accountability. However, these behaviours are often uh, given the label such as fraud or misrepresentation, as opposed to creating and spreading disinformation and malinformation. From a sociological perspective, and through this reframing of the contemporary understanding, the corporate wrongdoing is not simply a sterilised behaviour that is confined to corporate actions devoid of wider societal implications and relevant predominantly only to the corporate environment but it in fact places it in, uh, in the context of a means of hostile information activities through which there is a wide range of serious implications for societies and individuals. And accordingly, uh, with the spreading of misinformation and disinformation by corporations as a form of deliberate contrived corporate action to achieve corporate goals, it is possible to examine these behaviours from the perspective of CSR and business ethics. And that is what uh, we will do in this panel, and that's how we will examine this in this panel uh, and focus these discussions. Today's panel and discussion is uh, comprised, comprised of three outstanding contributors to the blog who, over the recent years, have made very valuable submissions and have been viewed and contributed to by thousands. Firstly, we have Cleander U. Cleander is uh, a National Committee on Accreditation candidate within the Federal uh, Federation of Law Societies of Canada. Having recently achieved the LLM from Coventry University, where he was awarded the Course Tutors Prize for overall academic achievement. In addition to contributing to the CSR and business ethics blog, Cleander takes particular interest in the way new laws and policies operate within the spheres of businesses and human rights. Cleander will be considering a lesson from Cambridge Analytica and how to avoid the social media trap. Next is Bianca Maria uh, Oprea. Bianca is a labor, social, uh, labor and social relations specialist at Engine Ro uh, Romania. She is responsible for maintaining the social dialogue with trade unions and dealing with collective labor agreements and labor law matters. 
Bianca developed an interest for corporal, corporate social responsibility and business ethics during her LLM studies at Coventry University, where she received a distinction mark for her dissertation in the area of corporate crime. Bianca will be discussing the corporate disinformation and the environment uh, in the Volkswagen emissions scandal. Finally is Celia Mokhtari. Originally from France, Celia holds a bachelor's degree in law uh, and an LLM in international business from Coventry University. She's currently undertaking the LPC in preparation to become a solicitor and is a contributor to the CSR and business ethics blog with a particular focus on international law and human rights. Celia will discuss matters of suppression of information to cover corporate harmful actions, the Takata case. So firstly, um, Cleander, would you like to open our discussions with your thoughts regarding uh, the lessons from Cambridge Analytica and how to avoid the social media trap? Thank you. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, um, as everyone knows. All right, as I was introduced, my name is Clander Yu, and I am a Masters of Law graduate from Coventry University. Today, I'll talk to you about a lesson from Cambridge Analytica, how to avoid the social media trap. So this is a presentation which will address two related issues, which were highlighted by the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which affected Facebook, which is now called Meta, uh, back in 2018. However, uh, as a cautionary tale, these issues certainly affect more than just Facebook. They affect the internet as a whole based on the way that the internet has been aligning itself with uh, advertising since its inception almost uh, through the use of advertising and data collecting as a means to push this advertising onto the uses of various websites and other online mediums. So the first issue which the Cambridge Analytica case highlights is the method of collecting user data without the consent of the, all of the users which were implicit in this collection and the lack of regulation on the collected user data afterwards. And these regulations which would have um, recently have been printed, uh, put out there are not necessarily armed and equipped to deal with all of the issues that we are still seeing in the ecosystem on the online. So as a refresher, the Cambridge Analytica scandal occurred back in 2018 when a large data set had been collected by an application on the Facebook platform called This Is Your Digital Life. This Is Your Digital Life was a third party application developed by a Cambridge professor, Alexander Kogan, and collected not only the data of all the users who signed up to use the application itself, but also collected the data of those users' friends on the platform. And these people were not made aware of this collection of data, nor gave consent to have their data collected and shared and used for whatsoever reasons. We have estimates between 50 to 87 million users' data, uh, which were collected in this manner. And this leads me to the first of the two issues. The fact that there was data which was collected and then sold to Cambridge Analytica without the knowledge of those people who were involved, which caused a ethical and moral and acceptable situation for every party involved. And where this collection of data was not done without the knowledge of the users or necessarily even the consent of all of them causes extreme problems in the fact that when data is collected, we are now subject to the GDPR in Europe, uh, within the European Union. And so any data which is processed by third parties outside of the end user and the subset that they're using is to be regulated. And here we have in a situation where it was not at all regulated and the information was then to be used to target those users after the fact. So there, this is a clear breach of the personal data production standards set in the GDPR. And the reason why this could have occurred is the fact that Facebook is a American company, which although 
subject to the regulations because they operate in Europe does not have the same level of regulation or legal framework in the US that European, Europe and the European Union benefit from. So we see a patchwork level of regulation across the world in terms of how to approach data protection of its users and collection and how that information is then manipulated or used afterwards. So how, what does this lead to? The first issue is that Facebook itself is a platform which has to regulate itself and, and find ways to uh, disallow these third-party app developers such as Alexander Kogan from A, collecting the data and then B, selling it on to other uh, interested parties who have unknown unknown goals and which they then use the data for. Um, Facebook has attempted to self-regulate after the Cambridge Analytica scandal was unearthed and they have taken many steps to do so. But however, as I have previously mentioned, this is an issue which affects more than Facebook and affects the internet ecosystem as a whole because of the fact that the data which was then collected can still be kept for unknown periods of time by these data brokers and third parties. And so Facebook, despite their attempts to clean up their own platform, is not able to do anything about data which has already been collected and which has already been put out there but into the hands of these other parties. Uh, so self-regulation by Facebook or Meta and currently can only deal with their own platform. And while this is a step in the right direction, it does not address the larger problem in the in this uh, means. So this leads on to the second issue, where is the data collection happening to internet users outside of the Facebook issue? And we can see that Cambridge Analytica had ye both done this only on their Facebook systems, but they're only one person, one party who could do this. It then becomes the whole internet issue. It is a iceberg tip, whereas the greater problem then becomes how this data can then be used by unknown parties for unknown reasons, and how this was now been a historical problem with the internet as a result of how it has sought revenue streams from advertisers who take the data of the users through the data brokers installing trackers and cookies onto websites that the internet user will use. And they do so freely. And when so these websites need to generate revenue somehow and advertisers offer a means to do so. But in return, they target the users of those websites by collecting their data and then combining it with other data that is collected from throughout the user's uh, activity and behavior online to create profiles. Uh, so how do we deal with this? Uh, we have to find advanced algorithms which can de-anonymize or sorry rather anonymize the user's data and or to uh, enforce the consent of data collection through all our sites as we see right now the gdpr has done this but the system in which they do so has led to a very convoluted system where you have to for every website that you visit to uh, opt out of the tracking and the collect data collection. And uh, still, this is only part of the problem. And it is only on the user, on the end user, to do this on themselves, which is not effective enough. We need to have higher level regulation done by different jurisdictions, such as Europe, but also in America, because of their 
uh, fact that so many companies which operate online are based out of the US. And so we need to ensure that the frameworks across the world match the GDPR and data protection or else we will have exploitable weaknesses in different parts of the world where data is handled or stored to ensure that there is no weakest link in this chain. And the main thing is right now, we know that all the data which is collected is legally done so, but then opaquely used outside of the legal collection. We don't know where this data goes and how it can be used. And there have been many cases where there have been abuses from people who buy the data collection and for whatever reason have nefarious purposes, which we cannot understand because we do not see who ends up with our information. Um, to this point, we have uh, many cases of domestic abuse victims having their information bought by their abusers and those abusers then taking advantage of it. Uh, this has happened in the US multiple times. Additionally, there is social media harassment and bullying, which occurs. And for many of these people, they see no other option other than to either never use the internet or social media platforms and or they take more drastic measures. And I, neither of these would be issues if we were able to more effectively use the ideas of uh, the right to be forgotten, which is one thing highlighted in the GDPR, to more, uh, more websites and different uh, platforms. But the systems which then allow this are very convoluted and are done by case by case scenario. And they have no necessary legal system to enforce this uh, request. These are merely requests to these data brokers or to these uh, social media platforms, but we are not able to guarantee that this information is fully scrubbed out from those data sets or uh, information sites. Uh, hi, so, sorry, Commander. Um, hi. Are you able to start, sorry, wrapping up in a, a few yeah, sentences? I was about to conclude right now. This is oh, just nice. the last two paragraphs. Um, in conclusion, like we see that the Cambridge Analytica scandal opened the eyes of many people to the dangers of unregulated data collection and sharing. However, this is a issue which is pervasive and affects more than just Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. It is the fact that this uh, data which is collected online can be uh, taken by anybody who wishes to invest the resources to then either use it politically to influence a, a certain uh, person to see things to, in a reasonable, unreasonable light, or it can be done through uh, personal targeting, or it can be done to cause uh, social economic instability, such as uh, multi-level multi marketing schemes, et cetera and can be caused for fraudulent purposes and to influence political elections. And we need to ensure that the regulation of online data is able to both protect the, uh, the end user from these uh, ma malignant collecting uh, actors, so malignant actors from collecting our data and to then further on enforce the removal of this data if the end user wishes not to have it within the systems. And these are issues which can only be resolved from a uh, high level jurisdiction such as the European Union, such as the national level at the United States to regulate all users, all these uh, companies which are headquartered there and have to be done so in a way which is harmonious and level throughout the world. It is not something that can only be done by one jurisdiction, but we can only hope that everybody sees that on the same level and wishes to enforce it at that um, degree.
And uh, so thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that cleanser. Uh, next, we have uh, Bianca. Bianca is going to take the opportunity to discuss corporate disinformation uh, and the environment uh, within the context of the Volkswagen emissions scandal. Uh, Bianca, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bianca Oprea. Um, I am a contributor to the CSR blog and a labor and social relations specialist at NG Romania. And uh, my presentation today will be on corporate disinformation and the environment uh, with a focus on the Volkswagen emission scandal. Uh, the Volkswagen emission scandal is an example of disinformation in the corporate world of uh, <clears throat> corporations behaving irresponsibly by misleading the public, their sole intention being the maximization of profits. Uh, however, what I will talk about will be the fact that the disinformation aspect in this case does not only tie into misleading the stakeholders of the corporation, but also adversely affects parties that are not stakeholders of the corporation through environmental damage. As uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you know, Volkswagen Group is a German multinational automobile manufacturing public company, uh, which manufactures and sells cars under uh, 12 brands. Uh, so in 2008, Volkswagen introduced this strategy called Strategy 2018, which had as the main objective to make Volkswagen the global market leader in the automobile industry by 2018. Uh, one of the most important goals being to increase vehicle sales from 6 to 11 million, as well as increasing the annual pre-tax profit margin to double. In 2014, researchers from West Virginia University conducted on-road testing of emissions from two Volkswagen model cars and found that the cars emitted a far larger level of nitrogen oxides when on the road compared to while being tested. And it was around 40 times higher level. Volkswagen used a specific sensor on 11 million vehicles, which was created with a purpose to cheat on emission tests and attached it to the engines so we could sense when emission tests were being conducted. The notice of violation sent by the US Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, to Volkswagen in, back in September 2015, stated that the software was created to cheat emission tests by sensing certain inputs, such as the position of the wheel, uh, the speed, the barometric pressure, uh, to show that the vehicles were compliant with the EPA emission standards, even though the level of emissions on road were, as I said, 40 times higher than the permitted norm. Um, two days later, after the uh, notice was received by uh, Volkswagen, the CEO at the time, Martin Winterkorn, publicly apologized and ordered an external investigation and later admitted that around 11 million of Volkswagen cars were designed to include the DeFit device and that they were sold between 2008, so the start of the strategy, and 2015. In March 2016, Volkswagen announced that the former CEO received uh, back in 2014 a memorandum which included information about the irregularities identified in the emissions uh, tests on the Volkswagen diesel cars, meaning that Mr. Winterkorn might have been aware of the issues well ahead of the scandal. Um, so in 2016, Volkswagen settled, settled a nationwide consumer class action and a government civil enforcement action. And it was later fined for criminal violations in the US in 2017 and in Germany in 2018. And by the end of the scandal, uh, it had to pay the equivalent of around $32 billion because of numerous legal proceedings worldwide, all of them associated with the emission scandal. As well, um, after being indicted by the Department of Justice in 2018, along, of course, with other executive directors on charges such as conspiracy to fake compliance with uh, pollution standards, um, Mr. Winterkorn was then charged by Germany in 2019 with aggravated fraud. But regarding environmental implications, the experts at the EPA agree that on a local scale, the extra pollution of nitrogen oxide can only make matters worse. Because once released into the air, nitrogen oxide quickly converts into nitrogen dioxide, turning into that smog that can exacerbate dozens of health problems, including asthma and bronchitis. 
And alternatively, it can also be washed into the ground in the form of acid rain, which can kill plants and animals. An analysis by The Guardian back then <laughs> revealed that affected Volkswagens in the US are likely emitting between 10,000 and 40,000 tons of toxic nitrogen oxides into the air every year. Uh, and just uh, uh, to compare, if those vehicles had complied with federal pollution standards, they would have emitted just 1,000 tons per year. So the Volkswagens have added between 10 and 40 times more nitrogen oxides pollution into our atmosphere than the EPA considers safe for people to breathe. Also, according to the same analysis, the 11 million affected diesel engine Volkswagens on the road worldwide could be emitting somewhere between 200,000 to 900,000 tons of uh, nitrogen oxides annually. And in contrast, Western Europe's biggest electrical power station emits just under 40,000 tons per year. Um, in 2015, as well, a study was released by uh, the public health researchers from Harvard, from MIT, um, who found that around 60 Americans will die prematurely from the excess pollution caused by the Volkswagens. And in 2017, the researchers um, released the same study, but on an Europe level, estimating that 1,200 people in Europe will die early because of, of the same effects. I give you these numbers just so you can make a mental picture of the gravity of the consequences of the Volkswagen's board of directors misconduct by disinforming the public about the emissions levels. In this case, the disinformation revolved around not only failing to disclose information concerning levels of emissions, but, some, but most, most importantly, deliberately keeping this information secret with the purpose to maximize profits. Besides the disinformation issue, the Volkswagen scandal brought to light one very significant internal issue, I believe, which is the lack of whistleblowing policies um, that have to be embedded deeply within an organization to minimize any such risks of corporate criminal offenses, such as disinformation and the misleading of the public, and to maximize good corporate governance standards. But as well, it brought to light the necessity for Volkswagen to inform and explain in a very transparent way every measure taken in their CSR programs in order to guarantee trusted relationships with, with its stakeholders. But returning to the disinformation aspect of this case, it caused much wider harm, not only to stakeholders of Volkswagen, but also to the general public that leaves and breathes the higher level of polluted air caused by Volkswagen's board of directors irresponsible behavior. The bottom line is that this information does not only affect companies through fake news in the media, it does not only affect, affect their reputation, but it, it emphasizes severe irresponsible behavior on behalf of the companies and can have much higher consequences. In this case, the lax board of directors control and their flagrant abuse of pollution norms um, still has repercussions on, on public health and on the environment as well. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Um, and finally, um, Celia, um, are you able to talk with us about the suppression of information to cover the corporate harmful operations and the Takata case? Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Stefan. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Celia, and I'm also a contributor to the CSR um, uh, blog. So I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the Tag Attack uh, scandal, but I'm going to um, make a rough summary about what happened, and then I'm going to discuss two issues that are highlighted from this scandal. So Tag Attack Corporation, um, is a company that manufactured automotive parts in Japan, Europe, and the Americas. Um, so the US branch of Takata is at the origin of the scandal. And uh, this branch was created around um, 1989. Uh, and this uh, branch led to the collapse of the company. Uh, 
after the first incident in 2007 happened. Um, this first incident was reported by Honda and was the first of a long, long list of uh, accidents and um, deadly incidents. So, um, Takata created inflator with a uh, propellant based on ammonium nitrate, which is a dangerous compound that could burn uh, and create excess pressure leading to an explosion, um, injecting sharp and dangerous shards into the vehicle, um, shards of metal into the vehicles. So instead of saving life, um, they were injuring and killing people. The reason why uh, ammonium nitrate was used is uh, simply because it was a cheap compound. Um, why they choose to use a cheap compound in their uh, airbags is because around the 90s, um, the, company, the US branch was um, confronting to um, issues with its inflator already. And uh, this impacted the profitability, the profitability of the company. So they needed to maximize the profit and they needed to save money. Um, so the Takata's executive uh, uh, working to uh, make this decision. Um, so they choose to use this nitrate ammonium, even if uh, in 1995, um, the patent application expressed concern about this product uh, that can explode violently and the excessive pressure and temperature change but they ignored um, this concern and uh, they just uh, continued to manufacture these um, airbags and to sell the airbag. So more than um, 100 million of airbag, airbags sorry, were installed in the car. Obviously, since uh, many people were, uh, many people died and were injured. So the last death, uh, uh, but because of Takata's airbag was um, last last year, uh, January 2021. Uh, so it's years after the investigation started, which is um, very concerning. So uh, the Takata scandal is the biggest recall in the world, and the company was fined one billion dollar and was bankrupt. Nothing would have been possible without whistleblowers because um, there were three whistleblowers, um, especially one, Mark Lee, who is a chemical engineer and was there when the company decided to use nitrate, uh, ammonium nitrate in 1999. He informed and warned his superior at this time about the, da the danger of such com com compounds. Um, however, this did not stop uh, the manufacturing and the selling of the airbag. So Mark Lilly left his job uh, with Takata uh, in 2000 after he gave up trying to uh, convince someone to listen to his concern. Um, as I said, Mark Lilly was not the only one. Um, there were uh, two or three more employees concerned about um, the use of um, ammonium nitrate, sorry. And they wrote a report. Uh, again, this report was uh, ignored by the senior executive. Instead, uh, Takata manipulated test data uh, about airbag inflator. They changing the fail to a pass for the quality report. Uh, Takata used on purpose over types of airbag taste, data taste uh, in the quality report and deceived the customers, uh, the regulator and the automakers, uh, technicians involved uh, in the testing of uh, the airbag were ordered to delete the data from the computer and to dispose of the airbag used. The first death, af uh, the first death occurred uh, nine years after, um, after they created uh, the airbags and they installed the airbags. And this is how Takata disinformation started to be revealed to the world. An investigation started by the NHSTA, which is in charge of enforcing motor safety, motor vehicle safety standard. So the first hearing was in 2014, but it was only in 2015 that the US uh, authorities took control and forced the recall of the cars. Takata first denied uh, the airbags 
that the airbags were defective. They then pleaded guilty in 2017 to submitting false airbag test with, sorry, to submitting false airbag test results to automakers to induce them to buy defective products. Um, company executive uh, has been charged with concealing information about 40 airbags. Um, after this uh, came into the light, uh, the automaker did replace uh, Takata Fultier's airbag, but with other Takata, uh, Takata's airbag using again ammonium nitrate, but with a disinfectant, um, which in reality will just save more time before it will explode again and um, kill people or injure people. So Takata went bankrupt uh, and now is uh, owned by Johnson Safety System. Um, the funny part, it's not really funny, but the ironic uh, part is that uh, since now uh, that Johnson Safety System is in control, um, more false data have been uh, discovered again, uh, thanks to whistleblower report again. Uh, but not uh, about airbags, now is about seat belts. Uh, there is an investigation to uh, see if uh, this happened while um, this happened while Takatas was still uh, trading, was still uh, uh, there, or if it happened uh, recently after the scandal of the airbags. I think that these new fast for seedbed tests are not really surprising um, when we know about how they did not hesitate to, fast, to falsify the ever tests. Uh, so this is, I think, uh, illustrates a pattern of deceit that continued for many and many years. So now um, there is a lot of, of things to say about Takata and uh, we can uh, point out a lot of things from Takata, but I think there is two uh, uh, interesting aspects which is um, how the company deliberately provided false documents ensuring safety to the public in the pursuit of profit, um, as Volkswagen, Volkswagen did before. Um, they, will, they willingly spread this information to disgrace, to disgrace sorry, the problems with the airbag and, kept, uh, and keep trust from automakers and customers. They were not thinking about what might happen in the future if they, uh, still can use this ammonium nitrate, but they were only thinking about how much protein they can, they can make with um, thanks to their disinformation. Um, there were email um, which Takata's executive clearly said that they had no choice but manipulate the test data to cross the bridge together, uh, which is completely untrue. They had the option of not manipulated data and not distributing false information to the public and simply improve the airbags. Uh, and this was the choice of safeguarding customer safety, um, but also the company ethics. The choice they made was the choice of manipulating people with false information and playing with the life of customers. The second uh, issue that I wanna raise with you is uh, the important role of the whistleblower in this case. And uh, I think um, that whistleblowers are a very uh, good mean in order to counter uh, disinformation. So um, if we think about it uh, in the auto industry, um, this is an industry that should be very uh, carefully supervised by regulator, such the um, NHTSA in the, um, in the US, sorry. They should pay careful attention to what the company are doing and to the accuracy of the information they provide. They should put in place, in place sorry, strict rules with strict sanctions uh, that apply if those rules are infringed. Um, they should create an environment where people witnessing such misconduct um, can easily and safely report those misconducts. Um, and fortunately, we can see more and more pro blower acts um, one act that was relevant for the Takata case uh, is the Motor Vehicle Safety Whistleblower Act. Uh, as I said, uh, whistleblowers are really good, uh, a really good uh, means to counter the spread of corporate myths and disinformation. Employer, employees sorry, are at the heart of the company, and if they witness any misconduct or if they know about what the company 
they are spreading um, mis and disinform disinformation information sorry um, they are the best person to warn and to uh, the authority in order to avoid death injuries damages bankruptcy and the environmental damage uh, to finish i just want to add that um, disinformation in the corporate context can be very dangerous and we had an example with Takata. The company was really a really big company selling to other big famous companies. So people trust those companies blindly and regulators are less watching uh, on those company, maybe because of corruption sometimes, um, or only because of their reputation. But the impacts uh, of corporate disinformation may have a worldwide impact and cross the border. Um, and this should not be neglected. Uh, some countries have the means and resources to protect customers to minimize the consequence of corporate uh, disinformation, but some countries not. Um, in taking sorry, Takata as example again, uh, for example, there were some country with a weak regulate, regulatory regime or weak recall procedure. Therefore, there might still be people driving a car with a defective airbag who doesn't, who doesn't know how, that his life is in danger. Uh, in this case, uh, I don't think Takata is the only company to blame. I think um, the automakers are also the, uh, to blame. Why? Because um, they also have engineer and um, I think, um, as Mark Lee uh, said, um, any engineer would have known that uh, the use of ammonium nitride can be uh, dangerous. So how can uh, the engineer of uh, automakers could not know that? So thank you. Excellent, that was, that was outstanding, thank you very much. Um, I think with one eye on the time, uh, because I'm, chronically terrible at timekeeping. Um, I think we'll open the, the questions up to the floor. Is there anybody who'd like to raise a hand? Uh, give people a second. I, overall, I thought it was an extremely interesting discussion. I think we you know, covered certain areas of, of principled environmentalism and how corporate misinformation plays into that. The idea of, of um, manipulation of individuals in, uh, to achieve political or other corporate aims, as well as the health and safety, you know, just the idea of, it, we keep being told you know the health and safety laws each of them are written in blood and i think when it, it would come to whistleblowers and things like um, the card case it's certainly certainly prevalent um but if we have no hands up or nobody uh looking to ask questions then uh i'd like to absolutely thank the panel thank you for, for your very um eloquent contributions uh and i'll hand back over to costa and diane thank you very much Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to all the uh, corporate social responsibility blog contributors, and thank you very much, Stephen, to moderating uh, for moderating this panel. So.